Hi, I'm Anthony Parent of Parent and Parent LLP IRS Medic. And in today's video, I'm going to be go, go, going over uh, a bipartisan uh, bill uh, that is working its way through Congress right now. Um, and this is called the Taxpayer First Act. And so I'm going to kind of give my reactions to this as I'm reading along. And I would just sort of say my, my father years ago said, as soon as you hear the word bipartisan, hang on to your wallet. So let's see how that works out. Um, so here we have the bill. This is, uh, this is uh, from uh, the Subcommittee on Oversight, uh, Chairman Lynn, Lynn Jenkins and Ranking Member John Lewis. Um, so this is uh, the Committee on Ways and Means discussion here on this. And here's the email you can send your comments to, um, April 6, 2018. I actually didn't get a look at this until uh, tax day ended a couple days ago. So I was a little busy, uh, and they released this March 26th. So uh, you had to be pretty quick with your comments, because um, there are some things I would certainly add to it. Um, so the first part we get to is the, um, the, the title one of this is Establishing an Independent Appeals Process, which sort of makes me laugh because... Um, that's always what the IRS Office of Appeal said. They said, yeah, we're uh, independent of the IRS. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Y you work for the IRS and you get your check from the IRS. So um, I'm not sure how independent, independent that, that can be. Um, but here it is. Uh, they want to make the uh, IRS Office of Appeals even more independent. Um, but I can kind of see, and this is really where I would add my um, comment if I wasn't uh, preempted by two weeks passing, um, in here, uh, for the first time, the provision codifies the IRS Independent Office of Appeals and provides co additional congressional oversight over decisions to withhold taxpayers from administrative review process. What I hope this means is that we run into situations where we, you know, when a client gets to us early, we know that the best solution is going to lie with IRS Office of Appeals because they're really the person, people who have discretion to do something. And here, here's an example. Um, let's say that somebody comes uh, to, to my office and uh, they owe quite a bit of money. And we live in Connecticut, so we can get some you know, high earners. And we have clients from around the world, so we can have people who owe millions of dollars. Um, and the IRS, uh, they don't really have the staff, and so that, that, that debt might st stick around for a while, and the IRS may send out notices, automatic, not from a revenue officer, um, that could result in some harm. Um, and one of those is a federal tax lien. And the way it works is that you cannot appeal the filing of a federal tax lien until it's filed which doesn't never made really much sense to me. Um, now, you can, you can appeal uh, a potential filing of a uh, IRS uh, tax lien, but that's only if they f send a final notice of intent to levy prior, and that is what you're appealing. And then you say, hey, look, part of this whole deal, don't file a tax lien. So I'm hoping that this is where we sort of have this um, expansion of power to say, look, any kind of case we can get to Office of Appeals. Uh, the other thing that they're going to uh, uh, share with us is uh, um, the, uh, the IRS is going to share the case against uh, the taxpayers. Uh, I'm not sure um, how important this is. This is a case where it you know, gives the taxpayers the right to, to, to the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and the process is sort of time-consuming. It's something we rarely do, actually, because, um, you know, it's going to take three to six months to get that back. And, you know, by that time, we better be on our way to some sort of uh, help. For some cases where we look to see some assessments that don't look like they were quite done right and the case is going to be going on for a while, yeah, we will request a FOIA. Um, so this, having this, you know, we don't see this as a bad thing. We see that as a good thing. Um, I don't mind having more information than less when we're trying to deal with the IRS. All right, Title II, I did read through this before, by the way, so I already had, I, I would have to can some of my outrage here. Um, um, and uh, so we're going to, this, this is really where I, I get, this is where I sort of went through the roof a little bit. This is the word right here. I'm going to highlight this word right there. Hmm, yeah. Let's just think about that for a while, okay? Not too long, right? Um, and when you call the IRS and uh, you get a hold music, right, and you're on hold with the IRS for an hour, hour and a half, or whatever the case may be, um, they'll say, you know, please hold while we're assisting other customers. We're not customers. No, 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 no. I would say we're captives. We're captive by this tax system that really nobody ever voted for in, in a way, and it just sort of spirals out of control. So it absolutely, absolutely kills me to see a um, 
bipartisan bill where you're calling taxpayers customers. We're, we are not customers. No, 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 no. No, no. If, if I was a customer, I, I wouldn't be your customer. Trust me, IRS. I would go somewhere else if I could, but I don't have a cho choice as a U.S. person. You are the agency. I am your captive. Um, so with that little out of the way, what does this mean here? A comprehensive customer service strategy. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, they're going to use best practices from the private sector. I don't know if you really need a bill for that. Uh, why aren't we doing that already? Well, it's because you have incompatible goals. Um, either you force money out of people or you provide customer service. Pick one. Um, you could do now. You could do things that, that don't harm people, like answer the phone quickly. But in order to do that, you have to have the staff to do that. Um, and you could also not have um, the staff so robotic, the staff actually helping people. But in order for that to happen, again, your, your goal can't be to try to squeeze as much out of people as possible. Um, and here it is. And now they're going to uh, section 202. We have return preparation programs for low income taxpayers. Um, so, OK, um, the IRS through its volunteer income tax assistant VITA program currently part partners. OK, fantastic. OK, right. So why do we need a law on that? Uh, this provision provides certainty for these organi organizations by permanent permanently authorizing matching grants to support VITA programs. OK. All right, that there. All right, that seems like a difference. Uh, every year, the 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 Vita. I am. I pronounce Vita. I don't know. Is it Vita? Hmm. So, in the comments, if if you if you know the right way to pronounce that, please let me know. Uh, the IRS has a free file program. Um, the IRS work, currently works with the Electronic Tax Preparation Service to write free tax preparation. Guess what they don't do, though? And this the IRS doesn't really have anything to do with this. Free state preparation, right? Um, so unless you're in one of the states without an income tax, you still have something to do. And those state taxes, um, you know, some of them, <laughs> you know, I've had a good look at um, probably every state tax return in the country. Some of them are pretty simple. I would say Massachusetts, not a, not a big fan of that one. It's a little complicated um, the way they have things set up. And some states are a little obnoxious to sort of fill out. Um, and now here's, here's a change uh, that's coming up. Low income exemption for payments otherwise required in connection with a submission of an offer and compromise. Uh, so if, you are, if your income is below 250% of the federal uh, poverty level, um, the IRS will eliminate the application fee and initial payment requirement um, for an offer and compromise. Okay, that seems okay. I would just say in practice, though... Um, this is what you sort of need to realize is that somebody who's at 250% of the federal poverty level, let's think about that person. Um, you know, look, we run into clients who, you know, hey, they, they had a successful business, everything was going great, and then something happens disastrous in their life, and they have a tax bill and no money to pay. It's some, something that happened, um, and the, the people that we can help the best are the people where something happened out of their control, but that skill set that allowed them to sort of reach those heights where they created a tax liability um, still exists. But in this case, this is sort of the problem that you have with people who are tend to be below the poverty level. They don't have the necessary skill sets to sort of avoid this problem. And they actually have a hard time understanding how to fill out an offer of compromise and get it accepted themselves, even when their facts are, are absolutely fantastic, even when, when by fantastic, I mean terrible because they have no money, no, no assets. So that's sort of the problem that you have. Um, the offer and compromise program is a great program, but the people it um, is designed to help are those who are least likely able to do it themselves. So they usually hire a law firm or someone like me, um, a CPA, uh, whoever it may be, to file and offer a compromise for them. But they have a problem, right? They don't have money. Um, so it's sort of this, this um, uh, issue where you want people to settle taxes, but they don't have the ability to do that. So they just sort of go, you know, kind of dig, it, dig themselves in a little bit deeper. Uh, usually what happens in cases like this is the IRS is pretty lenient in granting currently non-collectible status. That means they just don't collect and eventually the debt will expire um, as opposed to filing an offer and compromise. So while this is nice, its impact I don't imagine to be much of anything. Um, and here it is. The IRS is going to provide uh, public notice uh, to affected taxpayers 90 days prior to the closure of taxpayer assistance centers. Oh, yeah, they've been doing this. They've been closing taxpayer assistance centers. I don't know if you've ever been to one. Wow. Uh, get there early. 
because uh, they have seriously two or three people. Uh, the one I've uh, the, the one time I had to go to uh, one in New Haven for a lean uh, to to try to get a lean issue worked out. Um, I did show up about twelve thirty um, in the afternoon, and um, she said, you know, sometime around three o'clock, she said, yeah, we're not going to be seeing you today. Come in first thing, and I'll make sure uh, I, I help you out. Um, so they, the taxpayer assistance centers, um, there's not enough of them, and they actually don't know a lot of things. And I actually heard this from uh, a client in Tampa. Uh, they actually went to a taxpayer assistance center to ask them questions about their UK pensions and their taxable consequences of it. And the taxpayer assistance center couldn't help them out at all. And not only that, they didn't even tell them about the various penalties they had. They, could, they had FBAR exposure. They had uh, 8938 uh, exposure and a possibly uh, penalties for 3520A. I don't think so. I'd actually have to take a look at the, uh, the pension again because I do believe it was an um, employer's trust or no, employee's trust. Um, they had exposure on a whole bunch of things. Taxpayer Assistance Center gave them no indication whatsoever that their tax worldwide income that was taxable and that there was huge penalties. And so, you know, and this was, you know, these were, these were retired couple, you know, it's not like they have extra money to hire, go around and hire uh, tax attorneys. Um, let's see here. So we have low, low income tax clinics going on here. It will provide. Okay. Okay. It's kind of funny though, right? Low income tax. Wait a second. When the 16th amendment was passed. No, 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 wait, wait, this can't be right. They're all wrong. Wait, wait, why, why, why is this even here? Because when the 16th Amendment passed, um, the law that authorized the, the uh, imposition of a personal income tax back in 1913, those people said, like, no, 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 this is only going to affect the rich. The income tax is only going to, we're going to tax the top 1%, maybe up to 6%. That's all we're going to do. We're not going <laughs> to impose this on everybody in the country. So how could this be here? How could you have, a, what's the need for a low income tax clinic? It doesn't seem like if, Congress, wait a sec, unless Congress was lying. Oh, all right. Yeah, and then it makes sense. Yeah, of course. Um, so over the years, the income tax has expanded to include everybody. And, and remarkably, uh, the problems that low-income taxpayers have are, are, are significant, and they take a bunch of resources, especially you get into issues of earned income tax credit. It just sort of goes a little crazy there. All right, so sensible enforcement. Oh, boy, that, that, that Hmm, sensible enforcement. Well, actually, right now, the IRS is sort of sensibly enforcing because they don't do too much at all. The only thing is on those notices of federal tax liens. That's the issue. It's like, guys, why are you uh, filing these notices of federal tax lien without giving people a right to appeal? And also, you did no inquiry to say, is there something to attach? And this is what they say. Well, we're going to attach future income. Well, how do you know there's future income, right? <laughs> um, you're just assuming there's future income. But I'll tell you this, you file a federal tax lien against them, that future income gets a little bit harder. So I would say, you know, that's the sensible part I would actually want to do. When you file a federal tax lien, make sure there's something to lien as opposed to some theoretical interest. And also give someone a right to appeal before you do it. Um, now, the one thing that they are doing, the Bank Secrecy Act, which we have to deal with all the time because of our uh, for, uh, of FBARs, of, uh, Report of Foreign Accounts, that's where that comes from. But the Bank Secrecy Act has been used in weird ways. And there was actually a case recently, I believe, in Mystic, uh, Connecticut, where a, but it wasn't Mystic Pizza, it was a different pizza place, um, where the uh, owner was depositing every day, he would go and deposit about, uh, every three days, dep deposit about $8,000. Why? Uh, because he didn't want to have that cash around, he deposited it. Well, the IRS, the, the, the government looked at it as like, well, you're structuring your, your deposits to avoid the $10,000 uh, report uh, uh, that goes to the IRS. And so they seized the money, even though there was no probable cause of, of, of anything wrong. So here's something. This makes sense. Uh, the Bank Secrecy Act uh, will, uh, they're, they're going to try to fix that. Now, I would just say this. There's some other things I know about that they do, uh, that the Bank Secrecy Act does. Uh, and this is a huge scandal in some airports. Um, they will just seize cash uh, people have, uh, like, uh, and this happens at O'Hare, it's pretty bad. Uh, you have cash on you, and if it's over a certain amount and they smell drugs on it, right, if, if the FIDO smells drugs on it, we don't know. We could ask FIDO, well, what drugs are they? Um, um, they'll just seize the, the cash. It's like, you're free to go, but your cash is guilty. I'd like to see that change too, guys. Um, and also, I think we might want to get rid of the, uh, the FBAR or at least – adjust that to inflation because while $10,000 might have been a little bit more money back in 1970 when this was all passed, uh, my inflation calculator puts about $60,000. So, so really, maybe we should sort of, you know, pay attention to reality when we're sort of enforcing laws. Let's do that, right? 
Um, Let's see here. Sensible enforcement. Um, that's just a weird name. Um, exclusion of interests received in action to recover property seized by the internal revenue. Okay, so this means that uh, they'll return funds and interest to an individual whose funds were seized based on allegation structuring. The interest will be exempt from income tax. Okay. Uh, that's cute. I don't affect, you know, um, so when you get your money back in the interest, the, the 1% or 2%, it will, they'll, they'll have to attribute to it. You won't have to pay income tax on that. All right, that's nice. Um, Section 303 gets to an issue that's been going on for years, and it, um, and it has to do with the innocent, innocent spouse complaint, and there's another type of equitable relief. And the way the law was sort of written, maybe not, was that you sort of only have a limited amount of time to file a, a, an innocent spouse. But the IRS had this other thing called equitable relief that said, hey, look, you can kind of file that at any time. And there was a tax court uh, decision in Wisconsin. I can't remember the tax professor we got through, but basically the court said, okay, you can file equitable relief at any time. And it looks like this is just sort of clarifying uh, the re review standard in, in, the, in um, for uh, equitable relief. So if you are uh, seeking liability from a spouse's or ex-spouse's uh, taxes, you should have, you can do that at any time, hopefully. Um, and by the way, yeah, that's right. If when you're claiming innocent spouse relief, you do actually don't need to be divorced. We've won some where people are still married. Um, I'm not sure how that dinner table conversation is, but hmm, works. Um, and here's some rules for seizure of perishable goods, restricted only to perishable goods. Um, and I think perishable doesn't necessarily mean food, but it's things that just are timely and might go bad. Uh, we have a modification procedure for issuance of third-party summons. This is the John Doe summons that they're just going around. Uh, you know, the big one, the big news is Coinbase sending the John Doe. First, it was everybody. That included the party of me. Then it was people with $25,000 or more. That was no longer me, but a few of our clients have gotten uh, a little worried about those John Doe summons and not reporting um, their Bitcoin and other virtual currency transactions uh, as the property gains the tax code. Uh, requires to them to be. And also some, when you do have an account overseas, you actually might have an FBAR obligation. If you're just holding a Bitcoin in your wallet, I see um, no reason to put that on an a, 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 a FBAR form because first of all, it's not really foreign and it's really not a bank account. It's just sort of a virtual currency. Uh, currency is something that does not go on an FBAR form. You could have pallets of cash stashed somewhere overseas, doesn't really get reported anywhere. Um, except it might be on an 8938. I'd have to double check that one. Um, establishes of income threshold referral to private debt collection. This is, uh, they're, they're, just, they're just not going to back down from their mistake. So the private debt collection the IRS had uh, was really a dumb idea. They passed that in the FAST Act of 2015 because that was going to, there's all this hidden revenue. Well, that hidden revenue never came up. Actually, the program ended up costing the IRS money last year. So instead of admitting a terrible defeat, they're like, well, we'll just modify to make sure that there's, uh, you know, the people have a high income before they're referred to private debt collection. Uh, I don't know how you're going to do that. Um, I guess you look at their tax returns, but if you're looking at their tax returns and they have high income, maybe that's somebody that, that, that requires a revenue officer assigned to them as opposed to a private debt collector. Just saying, you know, maybe, maybe, um, and just maybe, right? Currently, the IRS does not have a filter in place to prevent low-income individuals with incomes below 250% of their pepper pile level from being referred to collection. Um, yeah, and that's why they're not collecting any money. You know, it's like there's, you know, there's a reason why companies charge off bad debt because it's bad. It's not worth the time to even look at it. But, you know, there's, you know, people in the government, they think a little bit different. They think that some bad debt, oh, no, magically, those people, and actually, this is something we've heard from uh, revenue uh, agents in the Connecticut uh, Department of Revenue Services when we're trying to get an offer and compromise through, and there, there is no statute of limitations on the collection of debt. So once you have a debt in the state of Connecticut, it can be collected at any time, but we're showing a situation where the person lifestyles has changed permanently. They're never going to make it. Here's an offer. Why don't you guys take it? And we've actually heard this. Well, your client could win the lottery. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, they could. Why, why don't they just do that? Um, limitation of access to non-internal revenue services employees to returns and return information. Why is this even necessary, right? I mean, did we not just collect the largest database of the most sensitive information on every American in the world? And boy, wouldn't that be wonderful if some foreign actor or domestic um, terrorist got a hold of that? Here we go. More cybersecurity and identi identification. 
Uh, they're going to do things to reduce identity theft. Uh, okay. And I could just say this. My, you know, here's the problem that you have. We have laws on the books, but they're not enforced. Uh, my wife used to work in the uh, inner city of uh, L.A., and she taught to a very large percentage of, of um, uh, immigrants of, um, who weren't here legally. And they thought it was odd that she, they thought it was kind of funny that she came here legally from Hungary. Um, but they all were right, right, very proud of the fact that they have uh, fraudulent Social Security numbers. Um, and this is the number one thing. This is sort of a waste of time. If you're not going to get rid of the root cause of these fraudulent returns, um, basically Im illegal immigrants grabbing someone's Social Security number, then why bother? Let's just, just go on to something else. Just like, let's not pretend that we're actually going to fix the problem here. All right. Advisory committee. That's boring. Information share, right? Is that boring? Or our established? Da, 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 da. Okay. That's really eh, boring. Information sharing. Mm, okay. Boring. Single point of contact for identity theft victims, right? Why even bother? Again, here. Okay. Well, we know why your identity thief was that stolen. Someone needed to file a tax return and they didn't, they legally couldn't have a social security number. And here, more, more, more. Confidentially, okay, compliance by contracts with confidential safeguards. Yeah, wait, they're not in place yet? Wait a second. Why is this necessary? Oh, geez, this is scary. Who's looking at my stuff right now? Um, okay, modernization. <laughs> All right. Hey, here we go. Development of information technology. Okay, yep. Um, yep. And this is all stuff that is, let's just say, never going to happen. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. The, the modernization of the IRS um, computing system is something that has been attempted since 1962. Um, basically, they have a massive mainframe um, that is sort of the backbone of their system. They've tacked onto it. And if you look at their, what their objectives are, they have competing goals. It just simply can't be done. They, they can't modernize it. Millions, maybe billions, have been spent trying to do this. It's just not possible um, because you have competing goals and no one's willing to give up anything. Um, and you do have to give up, uh, you know, and the, the, the example is, you know, um, Apple is great at saying, hey, guess what, guys? We're not going to have a floppy drive in your computer anymore. And so many of you youngsters might not even know what a floppy drive was, but boy, you had to, had to put it in there. And then um, there was like, we're just going to have a uh, UBS drive and, uh, and we're just going to have a disk drive. And that was with uh, the first or with a, um, a um, CD drive. And that was with the first IMAX, those big ones. Um, and that seemed pretty bold. But guess what? Everyone got used to it because somebody, you know, Steve Jobs saw like, we actually don't need it. There's actually better technology. And that's the sort of thinking that just doesn't exist in government. So they're going to hang on to their antiques, if you will. And these antiques will make modernization impossible. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Expanded use of electronic systems. Uh, all right. Yep, yep, yep. Uniform standards for disclosures, authorization, payment of taxes by debit and credit cards. Uh, okay, and this is uh, under current law. IRS can accept credit and debit card payments. You have to use a third party. Uh, don't worry. You're, you, you, you are going to be paying that processing fee, too. They're not going to, the taxpayer, uh, IRS isn't going to eat that probably to 1.9% processing fee on that. So you'll have that additional charge, even though it's debit, sort of not so fun. Uh, modification of title of commissioner of internal re revenue. All right, that's, that's, okay, instead of, Commissioner of Revenue will be changed to administer, Administrator of the Internal Revenue Service. Okay. And why not? Um, taxpayer Advocate Directives allow... Okay, we love Nina Olson. She's doing great work. She is truly on the taxpayer side. She just has a mountain of uh, inertia against her. Um, well, it looks like they're just going to sort of clarify... Uh, a few things. Clarify the salary for the NTA, too. All right. Elimination of the IRS Oversight Board. This passed. This actually, I think, already passed um, because the Oversight Board, nobody met. So it was, they had this oversight, uh, oversight Board, but they never got a, a quorum over the years. So they said, well, we're really not doing it. So why don't we just eliminate it? Which is amazing. I mean, that's actually amazing um, to me that here's some useless people in the government. <laughs> why don't we just get rid of them? Wow. Wow, let's keep, let's keep going with that. Uh, authority to modernize and organization of the IRS. Okay. You know, here, in here you're going to see this uh, RRA, 
98. And that was a really the bas- big last tax reform of the IRS administratively. This is not the tax reform of the code, but how the IRS um, um, works and operated. So this is this is really what launched a, a whole bunch of appeals and a lot of good things. Before 98, I mean, the seizures and the stuff that the IRS was doing was, was really, really bad. Uh, RRA 98 helped it out, except we still have the problem with the federal tax liens. It is better. Um, some old timers at the IRS, I think, derisively uh, uh, refer to as Rah Rah 98. I'm like, okay. Um, so hopefully, um, so modernize their so organizational needs, particular taxpayers' needs. Okay. Uh, mandated types no longer. So the provision allows the IRS to thoughtfully consider what a modern structure for the agency might look like. And I would say here, here's one that I would sort of throw in there. Um, There's sort of two main parts of the IRS that we typically deal with for our clients. We have self-employed small business. That's one part of the IRS. Then the other one is large business and international. And who goes to LB&I? Because this is a large business and international will not all international taxpayers are large businesses. Uh, some of them are small, some of them are medium. So it really doesn't make sense to put LB and I, you know, to have LB and I together. It would more make sense to say, um, to have international all by itself and maybe in a component with, you know, with large business. Um, the thing is, is I wouldn't stick it together. I wouldn't stick international with small business self-employed because it's too complicated for most people to understand. It takes a very unique person to understand how uh, the international um, taxation works, and there's not a lot of them. The IRS actually doesn't have a lot of employee. Quick aside, I talked to uh, the uh, group manager at one of the uh, field offices, uh, and she told me, and she was uh, running a SBSC uh, field agent, she, uh, field office. She said her... Um, she, she told me that her um, subordinates, half of them just refused to do international returns, right? And so what could she do? She can't fire them because she, she needs the, them to do, uh, do certain returns. So they stay there. They could just say, yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You, you could have someone else do it. So only half of them actually have the ability to handle the international. And the fact is, it's, it's just so time consuming. I mean, there's some absolutely brilliant um, agents there to be dealt they tend to be a little bit overworked because they're answering all their coworkers' problems. Um, now we have some something on tax court disqualification of a judge or magistrate to the judge of tax court. Um, so, okay, so if you're disqualified to be a magistrate, a U.S. magistrate in federal court, I guess you can't be a tax court. Uh, we're going to call, and then there's, we're going to call opinion and judgment used by federal courts to tax court. Uh, this provision uh, replaces the non-judicial terms of report and decision with opinion and judgment, respectively. You know, here's the problem with that one, though. Tax court is not a federal court. It's not. It's not really. It's actually a, an executive court. Um, so I don't think that's a good idea. Um, we, it, should, it should be a non-judicial term of report and decision. I think that's correct. It's not an Article Three court. Tax court is not. Um, it's, it's great. It's um, great. As long as you know how to, 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 to properly navigate it and you can find some good decisions and the cost beats, you know, the cost completely beats uh, uh, um, going to federal district court. I mean, for any claim you're, you're looking at uh, in federal district court, you, you better be you're going to be paying fifty thousand dollars or to start just to start for a very simple claim. Uh, whereas tax court, you know, the representation on that, you know, we can get in and out pretty, pretty quickly, pretty effectively. And sometimes taxpayers are able to do it on them on their own. Um. We got a title of uh, special trial judge, magistrate judges. Okay, whatever. Repeal of Deadwood related to Board of Tax Appeals. Wait a second. Here's another example. They're getting rid of Deadwood in the government. Wait a second. Uh, these guys, they're they're a little out there. This is uh, that's pretty good. Congress established the United States Tax Court under Article One. Oh yeah. Hey, look, of the Constitution. Therefore, references to the tax court's predecessor, the Board of Tax Appeals, are obsolete. Uh, this provision deletes the references to the Board of Tax Appeals. There it is. So, so um, all right. So we're going to get rid of things that don't exist anymore or aren't helpful. 
And uh, maybe that will start some help where we, again, you know, we really start looking at some of the things that are, are we well served? And one of the things that I think really needs, I mean, really needs a strong look and that we're hoping uh, we'll get some attention later this year is the territorial tax uh, for individuals that we really want to see some changes there. Uh, people are living overseas subject to, you know, just middle class people living overseas subject to wild reporting obligations. You know, tax return, you know, when we're preparing it, you have a foreign pension, you maybe you have um, uh, a life insurance policy. Um, maybe you have, uh, you invest in some mutual funds, you know, our bill with you might be, you know, over $2,000, $2,500 and you're just middle class to do it correctly. And that's not including any, you know, past compliance work you had to do. And so, you know, you could add up a bill just, just, just for us before. Now the good thing is the IRS isn't assessing penalties for the people overseas who go through the streamline program. But really, uh, the number one cost people have is usually for a firm like us. I think we're pretty competitive, but look, if you're middle class, $10,000 is a lot of money to pay to an attorney. And if you actually look at the amount of taxes the IRS collects from people overseas, these middle class people, it's not a lot uh, because a foreign tax credit applies. And pretty much uh, most countries do tax a little bit more aggressively than the IRS does. And so when you apply that foreign tax credit or the foreign income exclusion, which is uh, excludes the first about $100,000 from, um, from U.S. taxation, but doesn't relieve you of your obligation to file everything and your FBARs and all your uh, foreign informational reporting returns. You're trying to say, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. So that's really where I'd say, hey, okay, I see some things in here that, you know, infuriate me. I see some things that are pretty good starts. Um, I wish they had provided more comment time um, for us because those federal tax liens, the way they're filed, is really terrible. And, and more importantly, let's start to take a look at what is really going on with the IRS um, that the 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 that um, the, the, the writer of the federal income tax back in 1913. This is really where, I think this is what you need to understand to see how did we get to this point. The writer of the federal uh, tax, uh, uh, federal tax, income tax act in 1913, his last name was Hull, I can't remember his first name. He said that revenue was not the point of this. The point of the income tax code was basically to give control to the government to sort of dictate how people uh, live their life. That there is the number one explanation of why we are where we are today. So what I would challenge you to, to do is think about, should that be the purpose of the income tax or should the income tax purpose be to raise revenue? All right. So that was pretty quick. I think that was good. So this is uh, on the Committee of Ways and Means, Subcommittee on Oversight, the discussion draft of the Taxpayer First Act, I think it's going to pass, by the way. Um, they're they're going to be drafting the bill, but it seems like it has bipartisan support. This is Anthony Parent of Parent and Parent LLP, and I thank you for watching. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is that you subscribe to this channel because I'll be updating as we go along and more uh, more things. There's also some things on the IRS budget I'm going to be updating on. And again, the territorial for, uh, taxation, maybe a repeal of FACA. There's a lot of stuff going on in 2018, so be sure to subscribe.